What's that? Okay, thanks everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started so we can uh, save that 15 minutes and put it into our lunch time. Um, this afternoon, we're going to kick things off with a panel on the current threat environment for critical infrastructure. And uh, we're very pleased to have a group of folks representing it, uh, sectors and their ISACs. Um, this panel is going to be moderated by Bob Dix, who's uh, the VP uh, for Governmental Affairs and Critical Infrastructure Protection at Juniper, and he's also the chair of the Partnership for Critical Infrastructure Security. So I'm going to turn it over to Bob. He's going to make a few remarks, and he's going to moderate this panel. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel discussion this morning. Certainly, the opening keynote speeches and the first panel were quite good, quite instructive, and set a high bar for us. So we will do our best to try and meet that, uh, that expectation. It's good to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience, both from industry and government. And I'd like to thank the White House and DHS, Department of Commerce, and NIST for establishing this event today that launches a discussion around an important topic consistent with the expectations of the executive order and much of the work that many of us have done in this community for quite some period of time. I'd like to also thank our distinguished panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us today. And most importantly, I'd like to thank each of you, those of you that have joined us here in the room, those of you that are joining us on the webcast, for participating in this discussion, for this topic is important enough that it requires all of us to be engaged, sharing ideas, debating ideas, and driving solutions that can make a difference. So today this panel is titled Current Threat Environment for Critical Infrastructure and Industry Perspective. And in the context of the discussion that we hope to pursue today with this panel over the next 75 minutes or so, we want to focus on a couple of basic themes and frankly, I think they're very consistent. It was a good segue from the previous panel as we continue to build this discussion and drive this dialogue. First, we want to talk about how important it is for us to embrace the notion of innovation and collaboration. Second, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to leverage the vast private sector experience and the work in collaboration to develop consensus-based standards and best practices. You heard a lot of that discussed in the previous panel, we'll talk about that a little bit more here, but I think that it's not well known how much good work there is taking place in that particular space and has been for some time on a global basis. And thirdly, we want to talk about, from a standpoint of the threat, we're going to talk about the risk environment, we're going to talk about private sector investment and resilience. I think it's important for us to note that in cyberspace, much as in the physical world, it's not possible to protect everything all the time. So it really is about managing risk and delivering resilience, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Interestingly, on Saturday morning, I was walking my dogs on a brisk spring morning, and I looked overhead, and there was a flock of birds flying in formation. They were in a V formation, and I marveled at the synchronization that was reflected in that experience. And I thought about the discipline that it required. I thought about how everyone in that formation needed to understand their role, their responsibility, and to execute on that. I thought about how important it was to have coordination and collaboration. How important it was that there was an understanding of the pursuit of a common mission, and most importantly, everyone was heading in the same direction. So today we want to talk a little bit about that in this panel. And we have members representing information sharing and analysis centers that have been around for quite a long time. And we want to talk about our common mission, our shared responsibility, and how we will move together in the same direction to improve the protection, preparedness, and resilience of our nation's critical infrastructure and how this initiative around building a cybersecurity framework that I think has the greatest opportunity to address the 80% piece of this challenge, particularly around the hygiene piece of this, 
in delivering greater resilience in our critical infrastructure. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to our panel. I've asked them each to tell you a little bit about themselves as they give their introductory remarks. And after each has had that opportunity, then we'll gauge in a little bit of dialogue here with the panel. So again, thank you for joining us. And let me begin by turning it over to Scott Algier, who is the executive director of the ITI SAC. Thank you, Bob. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel. Uh, thank you to NIST and the team for putting this session together. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, today to talk about uh, the ITI SAC. Um, I'm also the vice chair of the National Council of ISACs, which uh, is responsible for bringing together the various industry-specific information sharing and, and, uh, and analysis mechanisms um, together to talk uh, to, to collaborate, enhance information sharing across the ISAC community as well. Um, so, along your topics of innovation, uh, collaboration, um, innovation and collaboration, consensus standards and practices, and resilience, I uh, would like to touch on each of those uh, pretty quickly in, in my time here. So, the, one of the main missions of the uh, ISACs in general, and specifically you know, the IT ISAC, is to bring members to, together to collaborate and identify um, not only threats that they're seeing on, on networks and sharing indicators, um, but also sharing mitigation practices. How did you identify those indicators? How did you find that on your network? What did you do to, to, to mitigate the attacks? Um, and so this is done uh, through various forms. Um, a lot of it, obviously, is member-to-member -member inter interaction, collaboration through various uh, uh, committees we have, a technical committee, uh, a, a specified group on, to share th uh, threats, um, we call threat indicators, where not surprisingly that that group shares threat indicators that, uh, organ that companies are seeing that come across their networks. Um, but we, as the IT sector also, where they do a lot of vendor-to-vendor -vendor collaboration outside of the ISACs th through other trusted forums. There's um, other organizations where the vendor communities uh, gets to Together and to talk about writing secure code um, and enhancing enhancing the development of, of, of code. Um, so there's a lot of activities around innovation and collaboration within the sector, uh, within the ISAC specifically. Um, one of the topics on the last panel talked about awareness and how do you get uh, how do you help. Uh, promote awareness within within your companies. We have a focus group on on promoting that within the within the ISAC, where we where the people responsible for their corporate uh, in, um, awareness programs are come together and talk about what works, uh, what activities that they promote within their within their company that is effective. How do they measure effectiveness? Are there practices from other companies that that um, that work? Hey, we tried this. This one didn't work. Um, but you know, so don't try that. So um, I think you're from a, um, from an innovative and collaboration. Um, there's a lot of ways our members collaborate with each other, but we also collaborate across sectors through the National Council of ISACs. Uh, we've, uh, part, we've partnered um, with the, uh, the IT ISAC, the Communications ISAC, the Defense Industrial Base, and the Financial Services ISAC. I uh, collaborated on a uh, pilot program about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now, uh, where we had a portal uh, that enabled us to share information uh, from our members. Um, the, the information from our members was, anon was anonymized so that people in other, in, in other sectors didn't know who, who was sharing, um, which companies in our, in our ISACs were sharing and information, and what we came to learn through that um, was a you know having a, co a common portal to, to enable us to share information was very effective from an analytical perspective because we are analysts could look at that and identify what were our um, attacks that were in common. Um, but B, what we also discovered, um, I guess similarly, what we also discovered was that we were seeing a lot of the same uh, actors, we were seeing a lot of the same methods, and we were by, uh, we were sometimes one sector was seeing it before other sectors were seeing it. So by, we were almost developed an early warning mechanism whereby once uh, one sector could say, hey, look, we've seen this attack, and share it with the portal, and then we were able to um, 
disseminate that information out to, to the other ISACs who were participating. And not only did it give an early warning system, but it ena enabled other um, companies in those other sectors to go back and, and, and look for those indicators. And lo and behold, they, they, they were, some of the companies were seeing some of these same attacks. Um, so I think this is one of the, the benefits of the cross-sector collaboration through the National Council of ISACs. We're looking now to replicate, um, to build out a, a new portal for it so that we can and, uh, build out a larger cross-sector information sharing capability that is beyond, that, that goes beyond the, the four or five uh, ISACs that participated previously. Uh, we also collaborate uh, with the um, with the federal government, I have, each of ISACs have different relationships with their sectors, um, but th there are you know, there are programs um, that we participate in um, that um, that that help two-way information sharing between industry and government. Um, some of these programs um, can really need a lot of work. Um, uh, we, we've lost some of them are designed more for government information sharing with the government and, and having government have visibility into what's going on as opposed to creating a, a broad based cross sector information sharing capability. Um, so consensus standards and practices. So one of the one of the topics I think that was really important for, for this discussion is that industry has come together. Um, at, and develop a responsible disclosure frameworks. Um, they're working together on, on code development, um, service, level, service level agreements with, with customers, um, sharing mitigation strategies across, across, the, across enterprises. So there's a lot of work already going on um, in, in the standards and, and consensus standards and, and practices, which gets, I think, to me to my final point, which is the resilience component. Um, in the IT sector, I, I was honored to lead, uh, be one of the leads, the industry lead anyway, of the group that developed the first, um, the baseline IT sector risk assessment, which took a um, all hazards approach to assessing risks to the, what we call the critical functions of the IT sector. You know, we, we um, we're not a heavy, heavily asset-based uh, sector. We rely a lot on, on critical functions, providing IT products and services, and enabling DNS and, and routing. Um, so we did a comprehensive risk assessment to assess those risks. And one of the most, one of the key takeaways uh, for related to this effort is, is that it was, it was a risk assessment. It wasn't a consequence assessment. It wasn't a let's create a list of really bad things that can happen assessment. It was an assessment that was based on um, attack trees with subject matter, with you that use the expertise of subject matter experts who actually built the attack trees. We identified the bad consequence that we want to avoid, and then we said, okay, hypothetically speaking, what would it take to create those consequences? So we looked at the threat actor. We looked at the, the capabilities of the threat actor. We looked at the resources that would be required. We looked at um, hurricanes and sunspots and, and earthquakes. Uh, we looked at accidental activities um, from employees or you know, accidents that might happen, uh, as well as malicious attacks um, from various sorts of actors. And, we're, and what this enabled us to do was to develop a realistic uh, assessment as to where the risks are in the critical functions, which then helps determine where we devote our, our mitigation efforts. Because as, as was discussed previously, we can't defend against every attack. And our, what, the infrastructure itself is resilient. It was confirmed in the risk assessment. Um, the internet isn't going to go down for, for a cyber attack. Um, so with that in mind, it's important to come up with, uh, with, 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 with strategies to mitigate the, the um, likely risks, um, not, just the, not, just the, not just the least likely risks that could cause the worst consequences. Um, it needs to be um, it needs to be a risk-based uh, risk approach so that we can, I, so that we, enterprises can identify uh, what resources they have available um, and de devote those resources to those most critical functions, those most critical assets, the most critical uh, intellectual property that they have. 
Um, so I, I think that that would be one of the biggest lessons learned that from the IT sector risk assessment approach that, that re-leveraged um, needs to be, uh, it can't be, you can't develop uh, mitigations for things that, that will never happen. You, you need, it needs to be a realistic set of um, a realistic risk-based assessment. Thank you very much, Scott. We'll now turn over to Mark, Michael Arsenault, who is here representing the Water ISAC. Thank you, Bob. Um, <clears throat> my name is Michael Arsenault, um, Managing Director of the Water ISAC. We have about um, 11 to 12,000 members across the country um, and in uh, some other uh, countries um, like the UK and uh, Canada and Australia. Um, we provide uh, threat alerts and threat analyses, um, a, a database of uh, best practices, documents, uh, guides, um, and an opportunity for, um, for learning and for members to share information about their, uh, about their experiences and uh, lessons learned. Um, I think the, the water utility sector, and that's drinking water and wastewater utilities, is a little different from the other utility sectors. We have um, tens of thousands of drinking water and wastewater systems in the country, um, ranging from the tiniest communities to those serving the biggest urban areas. Um, one of the things that makes the water utility industry unique, though, is our uh, built-in resiliency. Um, of course, we use um, SCADA, um, other industrial control system uh, technologies, to to move water, to treat water, um, dist and distribute water once it's treated. Um, but what makes us unique is that we can do those functions without the technology. We can operate those systems manually should some sort of incident occur. Um, the, um, and it's important also to recognize that computer viruses don't contaminate water. Um, and in utilities, utilities uh, routinely, uh, daily test the water at different points in the distribution systems and, and can notify the public to take action if necessary. Um, despite that, uh, we recognize the, the need for improved cybersecurity um, amongst our members. Um, the Water Sector Coordinating Council in its 2012 uh, strategic plan cited enhanced cybersecurity as one of its top goals uh, for the sector. And the utilities are making progress, making investments and making policy changes. Um, uh, but they're also having to contend, of course, with aging infrastructure, which you've probably heard about a lot lately with, the, um, with different reports about, uh, about the cost to replace infrastructure um, and um, climate change and, and things like that. Um, but nevertheless, the utilities are making progress, some faster than others. Um, and the sector organizations, and by that I mean the, the, the Water Ice Act, but as well, but also um, the associations in the sector, um, and, and US EPA, our sector specific agency, um, are um, making a lot of progress in, in spreading awareness and, um, and developing tools and resources. Um, for instance, Water ISAC recently worked with ICS CERT to create some best practices for utilities, some cybersecurity best practices. Um, and, um, and the American Water Works Association is working on a product to, uh, a guide to help utilities reduce vulnerabilities to their, to their process control systems. Um, now, partnerships and collaboration are, are key to, to the process. Um, and we've had terrific experience working with um, DHS's uh, CS&C um, division, um, in particular ICS CERT. Uh, we've conducted training, uh, or they've conducted training for the utility industry um, across the country. Um, we do uh, monthly webcasts on uh, cyber threats for the members, um, and, um, and, and, and we've made some other and there's some other uh, partnerships that we've created, like the um, um, we've recently signed the cooperative agreement uh, with the national the NCIC, National 
Cyber security, cyber security. And communications integration. That. <laughs> so that will help us. Um, that will increase the flow of information back and forth between the government and um, and the private sector and the water utilities, and um, beef up security as well. Um, and I can't say enough about the importance of uh, the PCIS and National Council of ISACs and how these groups work with the, the federal agencies, uh, but also cross-sector. That's our, that's our method to share information across the sectors and, 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 um, and pinpoint resources and areas for improvement and, um, and information sharing. Um, one of the greatest challenges, I think, to, to improving cybersecurity, at least in the water in wastewater industries, is um, not identifying what needs to be done, but getting the information to the to the users. Um, I think whatever guidance is, or whatever products or standards, practices are, are laid out in the framework, it really won't do much good if the user can't absorb it and implement it. And so I think the 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 products that are developed uh, to help utilities uh, implement the framework need to be aimed at a non-IT audience um, and, as well, and, and focus on um, the general management of these organizations to agree to make the decision to implement the framework. Um, I don't think it will go very far if, 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 uh, if the tools and guides to implement the framework are just too dense for a non-IT person, a manager like me, to absorb and, and implement. Um, so we appreciate the, the level of uh, commitment and to collaboration from the White House and from DHS and from NIST, and um, we look forward to working with, with all the agencies and our sector partners. Thank you very much, Michael. And I should have mentioned, I, I sometimes assume that um, all these audiences are involved in this work with us. I should have mentioned that each of the sectors in the critical infrastructure community has a sector coordinating council, and most have an ISAC, and they're closely aligned. The operational elements that are reflected by the subject matter experts that we have here today through their ISACs is a, an important and integral part of the collaboration that takes place uh, industry to industry and industry to government. And so we're joined by another one of those talented leaders here today. And as you might have noticed, we've tried to, to have a cross-sector reflection here of maybe some of the sectors that you wouldn't ordinarily think about firsthand when it comes to this cyber discussion. And when we get into the dialogue, we'll talk a little bit more about interdependencies. But we're joined by another one of those uh, sectors in Deborah Kobza, who is representing the National Health ISAC, uh, to share some thoughts with us this morning. Deborah, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I'd really like to thank NIS for the opportunity for all of the ISACs uh, to be represented here today. Or, well, not all of us, but a good portion of us here. Um, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of perspective about the, the nation's health sector and how we've worked um, to focus on innovation and collaboration and leveraging public-private expertise. It's, it's not about reinventing the wheel a lot of times that we talked about this morning, it's about connecting the dots. Um, the National Health ISAC um, supports not only the nation's private sector with hospitals, health organizations, pharma, medical device uh, organizations, blood banks, etc., health care providers and insurers and payers. Um, we also support the nation's public sector, you know, the uh, state departments of public health and the public hospitals and clinics that are out there. So you, you have to bridge both the public and private sector. Um, what we wanted to do was to really leverage um, research, innovation, and collaboration around cybersecurity. And we're headquartered at NASA Kennedy Space Center, where we have a global situational awareness center. It's kind of a, um, a smaller version of the NKIC um, uh, at Department of Homeland Security. And people say, aerospace and healthcare, how in the world did those two come together? Um, with the retirement of the shuttle program, NASA does a tremendous amount of life sciences research um, on the International Space Station. And they had tremendous facilities available there at Kennedy Space Center, so that's where we're headquartered there in the Space Life Sciences Lab. We're also able to utilize um, research facilities, labs, uh, training center there, 
uh, to hold cybersecurity training courses. So that was a, a really great partnership and I think a really good example of how you can reach out to people not only within your sector, but within the federal, state, local governments to really partner together. Um, how we have been approaching cybersecurity um, is, is really looking at cyber from an all hazards perspective and bringing the kind of united uniting the nation's health sector on a state-by-state -state basis. Working with the um, NIST and Department of Homeland Security um, as well as the Sector Coordinating Council um, and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, we're working with the health sector and have put in place a national cybersecurity council that has both public and private health sector stakeholders on that council. And we're implementing a national health care and public health cyber response framework, which this framework, I mean, this is great timing for us both to be able to, to work on this. And what that is doing is looking at cybersecurity as it impacts the health sector, you know, with the High Tech Act and cybersecurity around medical devices. Um, the networks that are being put in place out there to um, generate electronic health records and personal health information across the nation is like a patchwork quilt. So you can imagine the uh, security challenges and issues that we, we have in that, putting those type of infrastructures in place. So with this national um, cyber response system, we're working with the health sector to work on leading practice to understand cybersecurity from an all hazards perspective. If something happens in physical or cyber, they both impact each other. And then training um, folks out in the health sector is cyber first responders. So they know what to do in the event of an incident within their own organization, within the health sector, across other critical infrastructures and with government. Um, the other part that we're doing to help focus on education is leveraging the NIST National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, the NICE framework, as a foundational baseline to develop health sector specific cybersecurity functions, competencies, training, and all that to support it. Because if you don't look at, um, just like Michael said, if, if you don't look at cybersecurity from a role-based perspective, how does it affect me? We're all still in that bubble and thinking it's not going to affect us. So you have to stand in the shoes of a physician, someone in pharma, medical device, a hospital, nurse in informatics, and look at what does cybersecurity mean to me and what are my responsibilities. So that's what we're doing on a, a national basis to support the health sector, as well as increasing our capabilities for cybersecurity, um, intelligence, uh, information sharing, analysis, uh, doing cross-sector analysis, and getting that information out to the sector and then just as important with the ISACs is getting information from the private sector. As we send out alerts and advisories, we also need to get information as to what's happening out there on your networks. And if a piece of malware has affected um, your system and getting that information to us, because that's the only way we're going to be able to move from a reactive to a proactive stance on a national basis. Thank you, Deborah. So next we're joined by a veteran of these activities over some period of time, and I'll let him tell you a little bit about his particular role, but he's representing the electricity sector. He also serves as a co-chair of the Cross-Sector Cybersecurity Working Group and chairs the Industrial Control Systems Joint Working Group. I'm confident that he will get you charged up <laughs> as he plugs you in to what's going on in the electricity sector, uh, Tim Roxy. No pressure, no pressure. Thank you, folks. Um, uh, Tim Roxy, Chief Cybersecurity Officer of North American Electric Reliability Corporation, Director of the ESISAC. ESISAC is active uh, across North America from the uh, tip of San Diego, sub in Mexico, all the way up through the northern provinces of Canada. 
So I've got 35 years' worth of utility-based experience, 40-plus years um, computer computational technology experience, everything from hardwired deterministic things to weapon systems to you name it. So I've been around the block a couple of times on a couple of different presidential panels. But what I want to do today is frame two concepts, because unfortunately I could not use PowerPoint. And how do you do this without PowerPoint? <laughs> but I see people have these pencils and papers. So draw a horizontal line on any piece of paper or across the back of the person in front of you. And in the middle of that line, put a star, any star you want. Now do a triangle underneath of it. What you've just done is draw two visual graphics. One is called left and right of boom. Go figure, it's a horizontal line. It's the timeline of our lives that are defined by the events that happen within our lives. And the star is the boom, right? Everybody deals with booms, whether it's the bumper of the car in front of you that you were texting behind as you slammed into it, or it's something really, really uber bad that got hit into the financial services sector we're trying to prevent in the electricity sector. Left of boom, right of boom. What do we do to prepare to live across that timeline? Well, for one sector, we have an ANSI certified process, which is exquisitely innovative in the way in which we rolled it out at NERC, North American Electric Reliability Corporation. It is a very collaborative environment. It consists of a 1,108 requirements scattered across two broad families of uh, regulatory uh, structures, one on physical uh, reliability. It's called the 693 reliability standards. And the other one on the other side is the, it's the much smaller one, but still the one we're focused on here today, which is the 706 and the 761, soon to become 761. Not quite certain of the timeline. But those are more focused on, on cybersecurity, physical security associated with cyber critical assets. So 1,108 requirements scattered across two large families of requirements. It is the largest collaboratively developed by industry mandatory and enforceable body of standards on the planet. Not just in North America, not just in Kiev, not just in Beijing, but on the planet. Think about that. It's developed by the people who have to implement it. Oh, and a whole lot of other people who are just interested in standards. They don't necessarily have an electric footprint. They're just interested. All of these people develop these standards in a collaborative environment. Some would say it's not enforceable. Some would say it's not mandatory. We have heard this over and over again from many people over the last several years. Nay, nay, I say, it is enforceable. The voluntary standards, I heard earlier today, uh, standard settings is a, not a federal thing. But I'll tell you what, the enforceability and the backstopping of that enforceability is very much a federal thing. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the ultimate federal authority backstopping the FERC NERC SIP industry developed standards. So very cool stuff. Now, investments in resiliency. That's the left and right of boom. Let's look at the triangle. Remember the triangle? Look across the bottom of the triangle. Put a little horizontal line there. That's the standards. Thank you so much for playing along. That's the set of standards, right? It's, it's Title 10, it's Section 215, it's CFATS, it's a variety of things. It's including the framework that we're developing here with NIST. All of that stuff at the bottom, that takes most of the known risk, the stuff that you know about vulnerabilities, lead you to patch management, the things where humans make mistakes, lead you to configuration management, all of these things. Those things live and breathe down in that bottom. Whether they're enforceable or not is a decision for the entity or the industry. But those live down there. But what about the new stuff? The fantastic cool stuff that happens the second Tuesday of every month. Anyone familiar with what goes on there? <laughs> Some Wintel based operating system shoves out a whole grunge of stuff and says, here, oh my god, go fix this now. Right? Well, cool. That stuff sometimes, very rarely, will actually get to the point where it challenges something very important to a sector, financial services sector or whoever, in my case, the electric sector. The thing that goes above that first line on the bottom of that triangle is the surge risk controls, those things that you do when your normal conditions are pushed abnormal. Typically, this is what happens when some one of your friends in your sector has gone from the left comfortable all day long, hits that little star thing, whatever the shape of your star was in the middle of your line, and then crosses over to, oh my God, look, I've detected something. I'm now going to respond and recover. How do you do that? You do that in our world with the ISACs. You do that in collaboration with your ISAC and with your sector partners and across the other ISACs. We share information very, very heavily. 
We share threat information near real time in some cases uh, with a very large group of people across multiple continents. Uh, NERC has an ISAC, has a uh, HYDRA. A HYDRA is a group of subject matter experts that are global. When something crosses that line, takes me out of my baseline configuration that I'm comfortable in living in, and I've crossed to the other side of boom, what we call right of boom, and I have to do something to prevent others from following that unfortunate utility entity or sector which went over to the right-hand side and is now recovering, if I go there, I have a very large global community that I can push out my query. Hey, this happened. Can you help me understand this relative to a generator, relative to a transmission, relative to a control room, relative to a balancing authority or reliability coordinator? Help me understand how to articulate my messaging to the community that now has to stand up and prevent something we know to have happened. That's a function of an ISAC. NERC has a very robust function in that respect, and we're fortunate to have a global network of peers uh, that we work with. Now, do you ever exercise, just pretend that you're going to trip over to the other side of that right-hand star, right? You're going to say, ah, I think I'm going to say denial of service, or I think I'm going to shamoon my corporate offices, or I'm going to do something uber bad. These are exercises. There's actually a standard in the NERC SIP suite that says you'll exercise every year. And we hope people are creative about that. In the NERC ESI SEC, we actually have a cyber risk preparedness assessment, part of our framework to probe into how well we as an ISAC function and how well entities can coordinate information sharing with us. Very interesting. Years ago, before the SIP standards were out and enforceable, the cyber risk preparedness assessments that were done in just the early days of the SIP, uh, the lexicon was different. People were saying, I think you should do this. And what they meant to say was, I think this happened. But over the years, as the standard rolled out, guess what? A common taxonomy is being created. A common lexicon is being created. People are now able to talk about things as arcane as an electronic security perimeter. And it's commiserate physical security perimeter. They even go to the acronyms, PSP and ESP, and they understand each other. We have, a, we have another standard in a different suite about how to talk to each other. Go figure how to talk to each other. If something is really important that you get the message across, we use a thing called three-way communications. Hey, I understand you want me to do this. That's right, I want you to do that. Thank you, I'm gonna do this. It's stayed, it's formal, and it's very important to be done in a particular way. So that is our framework, writ large. The top piece of that triangle though, just not to let you pretend like you missed it, that little piece at the top, right? U.S. government, Canadian government, Right? That's a government, right? So when things become so thorny, so ugly, that the baseline controls that are in there right now with all the standards and including the new frameworks that roll out, the surge controls where the alerts and notification products, either from your vendor or from your ISACs, when those things are inadequate or perceived to be inadequate, guess what? There's a policy trigger that needs to be pulled, and that policy trigger, when you pull it, means that the federated authorities of the governances need to get together and take a specific action if they understand what that action could potentially even be. The whole concept of the doctrine of cyber warfare is still being written. We don't know how to behave in a cyber conflict between nation states where the bulk power system, the water system, the health system, and others are getting collateral damage. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And our final presenter this morning is representing, is Joe Vines representing the communication sector. Of course, communications and IT are part of the networks that underpin everything that we rely on in this particular space. And the communication sector has been dealing with this challenge for a long period of time. So we're very pleased to have Joe here representing the communication sector ISEC. Joe? Great. Thank you, Bob. And um, I appreciate uh, being part of uh, this distinguished panel. And uh, thanks very much to the Department of Commerce and NIST for inviting the ISACs into this important uh, discussion today. Um, I have, uh, well, I'll go into my background quickly. I, I uh, work for Time Warner Cable. I'm the Director of uh, Enterprise Business Continuity and Crisis Management. Uh, that's my day job. Um, for the ISAC, I'm the, uh, the current chair of the communication ISAC. And I have some prepared remarks because, uh, I, you know, our industry, I think, has, has done a great job uh, over the years, and I, I didn't want to miss uh, any of the, the salient points, and I think it's important to this discussion. So I'd like to start off my remarks by giving you a brief history of the communication sector's partnership with the government, especially during times of crisis. 
The communications sector has had a long uh, history in this area dating back to the Kennedy administration when the U.S. was dealing with the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was very important to have uh, resilient communication during that time. Not that it isn't today, but the government believed then and believes now that resilient communication is absolutely imperative to national security and emergency preparedness. Since we believe this as well, <clears throat> we work very hard to ensure that the United States has robust communication networks that are second to none around the world. As such, we have built our practices on the foundations of national security and emergency preparedness and have organized ourselves under three pillars. The first is our participation in the National Security Telecommunication Advisory Committee. That's a mouthful, NSTAC. Second is our Sector Coordinating Council, and the third is the ISAC, which uh, obviously I'm a member of. The NSTAC is made up of the communication sector's most uh, senior executives, and they advise the President on policy matters related to enhancing our networks to support national security. The CSCC, utilizing the CPAC, or Critical Infrastructure Partnership Advisory Council protocols, works collaboratively with our SSA and GCC to develop plans for implementing that policy and conducts many risk assessments. Most recently, uh, the 2012 uh, publication of the Communications Sector National Risk Assessment. The ISAC is the operational arm of the sector and is made up of 61 private sector entities including carriers, ISPs, satellite broadcast vendors, and trade associations. The private sector uh, leadership is all volunteer, and we serve for two years. The ISAC members are operational, and we meet every Monday morning to touch base with each other and our government partners. We have been doing so for more than 30 years. This steady state allows us to rapidly activate during times of crisis, most recently during Superstorm Sandy where we worked side by side with not only our government partners, but with each other to ensure the communication networks were operational. We are supported in these efforts by the DHS National Coordinating Center Watch, which is one of the operational components of the NCIC, and I'm glad I don't have to uh, describe that uh, acronym. Thank you. Um, it is the NCC Watch who provides us with both physical and cyber alerts. Example of these uh, include, but are not limited to, sunspot activity, GPS testing notices, train derailments, and more recently, uh, cyber joint information bulletins, malware analysis, and indica indicator and warning alerts. The industry, in turn, provides feedback to the government on what actions were taken that is carefully stripped of any customer data or identification. This process works very well and is one uh, that has evolved over time to meet the evolving issues facing our sector. The NCC and the NCIC also provides classified information to those companies that have a need to know and has the, uh, the requisite clearances. Uh, the cleared members, in turn, work to ensure that actionable information coming from these briefings uh, is modified sufficiently so it can be passed on to the ISAC members that can act upon the, that information. Um, in the cyber uh, threat environment, we protect our own enterprises, our networks, and protect our customers against multiple threat groups threat groups, rapidly changing techniques on a daily basis. Sometimes the targets of these attacks may be our own customers or might be uh, customers of our competitors. To combat this, we act upon the information we receive from each other and our government partners. We have state-of-the-art monitoring centers that operate 24 by 7. We constantly conduct both internal and external penetration testing. We also work closely with our IT partners to ensure that we have the latest security patches installed and we offer many types of managed uh, security services of all, to all of our customers, from residential, small business, to multi-billion dollar corporations and infrastructures. While there will always be an opportunity to improve our mutual processes, we have found our partners to be open, collaborative, and they have never broken trust with us. While the operational partnership with the government has been in place for decades, it continues to change and evolve and is dynamic. And this dynamic partnership has contributed to the U.S. receiving some of the highest levels of service globally. This partnership was not built on a static standard. It has been built upon practices that provide value to both parties. It is tailored to the diversity of providers, both in size and type, and enhances the availability or resiliency of our network services. For more than five years, the COM-ISAC has been actively engaged in addressing operationally what type of cyber information we want to receive from our government and critical infrastructure key resource partners, what information we can share with them while preserving our customers' privacy, how we will coordinate our activities in the midst of a major cyber event, and institutionalizing with our own companies how to implement those changes. These efforts are now paying off, and we are pleased that our partners have again remained open, 
collaborative, and have known us well enough to recognize and accommodate our privacy responsibilities. In summary, I would really like to encourage this panel and the remainder of this workshop and future workshops to not only focus on what needs to be fixed, but also on what works. I need not remind everyone that communication networks operate very effectively on a daily basis, and we have a vested interest in keeping it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you to all the panel members for your remarks. So look, the majority of companies and organizations represented in the panels that will be discussing this matter today are companies and organizations that generally get it and are making investments in addressing this challenge. There's a broader stakeholder community out there that maybe isn't quite as informed, doesn't fully understand the risk environment, doesn't have IT staffs. And the notion, I believe, at least as I understand it, in developing this cybersecurity framework is to aggregate and correlate a series of standards and best practices that are being utilized across this community that are making a difference and make them available to that broader stakeholder community to assist them as they attempt to improve their own protection profiles. So what I think I'd like to do now is ask each of you to reflect, and I talked about earlier, there's this whole notion of private sector, public sector, collaboration and engagement on developing consensus-based standards and best practices has a long history. This is not a new process. So I think, as I heard Dr. Gallagher mention earlier, it's not the intent to invent something or start something new, but instead to leverage the experiences that we have so that we can address these challenges on behalf of a broader stakeholder community. So I wonder if each of you would take a moment to explain in your own experiences, and we can start anywhere that you want to, with that process of developing consensus-based standards and how they've made a difference in improving the protection profile in your organizations, in your companies, in your sectors, and your experiences with how that has worked from a collaborative standpoint and in a global context. So who, who would like to start and share some thoughts around that? Tim, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, so my first experience in the um, bulk power system uh, was in Orlando at a standards drafting team meeting. Uh, my actual uh, first regulatory experience goes back several decades before that when I was starting to work with the NRC as a nuclear sector um, asset owner operator, if you will. I was involved in operations and maintenance. And that was a different realm. So I step into the bulk power system. I go to Orlando, and I'm in my very first standard drafting team meeting, and I have a variety of people around me. And the people around me are uh, standard drafting team members who are selected by a variety of mechanisms, along with other people, like myself, I was just observing. And the dialogue was just incredible, uh, very, very um, robust, you might say. I don't want that standard. I want it this way. I want it that way. And they wrestle, wrestle, wrestle with a lot of different drafts. Ultimately, when all is said and done, the standard drafting team, very collaborative, very open group, they bring this product out, and then it goes out for comment. And I'm familiar with a lot of public-private partnerships, and I'm familiar with comment periods, and, you know, sometimes I get my documents back, and there's more red line, blue line, green line on it than, than normal lines. And I, I will reflect upon, I think it was Rev 3, version 3, where we had something like 10,000 comments across four or 5,000 pages of comments. And in an ANSI collaborative, transparent process, guess what? You can still go out and read some of those comments. Quite entertaining, quite informative, quite illuminating in terms of the different aspects of people coming together to fuss amongst themselves to do the right thing. Uh, ultimately always to try to get to the right thing. And to see how the consensus gels down um, is, is just remarkable. And to see how the people in the back end of this ANSI process, the NERC staff and the committees, the technical committees that NERC has, how they wrestle those comments to ground and, and adequately reflect upon and address every single comment. You do not throw a comment away. You don't say, oh, I think that was wrong. I think that was inflammatory. I think that was bogus. No, you redress every comment. That's what an ANSI open transparent process looks like. And at the end of the day, when you finally get to the enforceable component, you can look back and say, you know, that penalty or sanction or fine, that hurts. That's going to leave a mark. But you know what? It's right. This is where we need to be. Sometimes it's a little high, sometimes not so high. But that's where the process brings you 
thousands and thousands of comments across thousands and thousands of pages. And to the, to the NIST staff, good on you. You're going to be reading an awful lot of stuff. Hmm. <laughs> and they're well prepared for that. Uh, who, who, who else? Who else would like to comment on this, on, on your experience? And, and maybe if I could just add you, ask you to add to it too, how important, once we get this framework built, how important is a broad education awareness campaign that's attached to that to help socialize to that broader stakeholder community? Yeah, um, I can really give you, a, I think, a, a good perspective of what we've been dealing with on trying to put in place this national health care and public health cyber response system. When we first started uh, working on this with, with HHS and, and collaborating with, with DHS and the Sector Coordinating Council, we were looking at approaching the research um, and getting uh, the health sector involved on a regional basis. Um, like FEMA and HHS has the country, you know, sectioned in, into different regions. And we, we quickly learned that that wasn't going to be effective because we needed to look at things on a state-by-state -state level basis because response efforts are done differently in each state. And sometimes within states, each county or township, you know, does things, response efforts differently. So in, in looking at the research, we, we had to stand in everybody's shoes from a small rural hospital to a large hospital to a large uh, pharmaceutical company, you know, understanding what the uh, risk landscape was like with, with Merck Corporation or St. Luke's Healthcare or Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, all different types of, of healthcare organizations. Um, but once you can understand that and you really get them to participate um, where they have a defining voice. And I think that's one of the best ways that we're going to be able to work together and roll out this framework so it's not just a framework in a PDF file on a website or printed out in a, in a file folder, that it's something that we all leverage and we all use. So this opportunity we have right now for the private sector to really be at the leadership table in developing this cyber framework is, is tremendous. I mean, this is really our opportunity to have that defining voice and be part of this process. And then when the framework is defined and goes out for the first comments or the first draft um, and refining it as we go through it, everybody will, will have ownership of it and that awareness and the education piece in order to implement it, I think will go much smoother. But we have to also look at it as a, a living document. We have to keep refining, um, as, we, as we all know, as, as we go forward. But having everybody come to the table with that defining voice and attend these workshops, you know, that are going to be occurring around the nation is, is critically important. It's um, like the old saying, if you don't vote, don't complain. So th this is really the private sector's opportunity and, and the government's opportunity to really work together uh, in support of this framework. Thank you. Anyone else? But I'll just comment. You know, when I think about this, I, I think about the, some of the things I cited in the opening remarks. Um, you know, the NSRA that was just completed, you know, it was a collaborative effort between government, you know, the CSCC and, and our, our GCC um, and, and others. Obviously, the CISRC work that we do with the FCC and kind of more informally, our, our daily and weekly interactions with one another. We all learn from that, and I think that all feeds into, um, you know, the, the, the end product, if you will, and the collaborative effort uh, that, that takes place amongst, uh, you know, our, our uh, industry and, and sector and, and the other uh, sectors across. We also do um, after-action reporting after major events, and uh, cyber is no different uh, than, than any other event. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's got specific nuances, but, um, you know, it's, it's, if there's a major issue, uh, you know, we learn from uh, our experiences through that. So I think that all contributes to, um, you know, consensus-based standards, and that's, that's really where it comes from. So that's by, by the way, before thinking. Scott comments, I'll just note that the presenters will all stay after for a few minutes as you're going to lunch to help explain any of the acronyms <laughs> that you wrote down and you weren't clear about. They'll be here to help give some definition as to each of those. I won't be. So Scott, did you have some? Sure. So um, I, I talked a little bit about some of the activities the IT sector participates in um, in 
collaborative standards development, some of those included the responsible disclosure, the common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, there's many, uh, there's some activity going on in the software assurance form um, that um, IT sector companies are, are part of. But to your comment about the um, education and awareness, I, I think that uh, yes, I think the effort is needed there. But I also worry a little bit about whether we're setting a false sense of security by saying, here's a framework, follow the framework, and you're going to be secure. Because A, you know, there, it, it's going to take uh, eight months or so to, to develop the framework, and the threat's going to be changing in those eight months. The tools that they use to, to attack us, the methods that they use to attack us, uh, as well as some of the um, uh, mitigation uh, pra practices in, in, as a result will, will change be, uh, between that. And then the, 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 the other comment related to this is in some of the read ahead material um, I, I saw in preparing for this uh, in one of the FAQs it talked about the purpose of the, of the framework was to develop a sufficient level of cybersecurity performance and system resiliency um, and I thought that was kind of interesting because generally that's the role of industry, right? Industry develops, industry determines uh, as part of their business operations what the, what the level of, of, of risk they're going to tolerate, what the level of, of performance that they're willing to accept within their, within, within their enterprises. So to the, extent, to the extent that we can develop some, a, a framework that gives them the capability and, and it helps inform some of that risk management and risk uh, mitigation decisions, uh, I think I think that, that that's useful, um, but when we do the messaging, we need to make clear that this is. If you, we need to make clear that following the framework isn't going to absolve you from, of, uh, or isn't going to pre prevent all attacks on your networks. It's not going to make you bulletproof. Um, and then, you know, this, um, the, 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 I don't know where the time frame is or where the schedule is for updating the framework, um, but it's going to have to be pretty much all the time because the 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 threat uh, the threat actors the techniques um, require require constant updating. Good point. Uh, in the in the water sector, we have we have voluntary well industry standards, and that's um, just to put it simply you know, the on the me me mechanics and procedures um, inherent in operating in water and wastewater systems, but we also have water quality standards which are regulatory. So that's not a consensus-based process. Um, um, and so this, this process uh, to develop the framework and the other uh, components of the executive order is um, refreshing and welcome. Um, the, I, I think Education and awareness is going to be uh, key to, to the success of this whole executive order. Um, there has to be an effort and an, an investment to simplify and interpret the jargon. Um, most standards are perfectly unintelligible to most people. Even if they're in the industry, they've got, you know, it takes a lot of effort to understand um, and implement standards. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that the SSAs that um, will take the framework and, and work with their sector coordinating councils and whatnot to, to, to spread the word and get buy-in, I hope they look at um, best practices in terms of communications um, and recognize who their audiences are. Thank you very much. And let me just take a moment and put the plug in for each of you. For those of you that have had good experiences in participating particularly in industry-driven initiatives, a trusted computing group, Safe Code, the Open Group's Trusted Technology Forum, a Software Assurance Forum, you know, th there are lots of examples of great success of work that's being done that's largely industry-driven but is collaborative with government that can help inform this process. So responding to the RFI and sharing those experiences as examples, tangible, real-life examples where we have worked together collaboratively to drive some of these solutions, I think would be very useful. And, and obviously the NIST folks can speak for themselves, but I think that's something that they're inviting and asking. So we as, a, we as an audience, both here in the room on the webcast and those that aren't able to be with us today, also have an opportunity to contribute to this process and share those experiences where we've actually done that collaboration and built those consensus-based standards and where it's making a difference. Tangible examples, I think, would be valuable. Bob, can I add something? Yeah, please. I think this process is so unique that I think a lot of people are saying, yeah, right. You really, you know, 
I mean, I've seen that amongst my own colleagues. Um, you know, we'll believe it when we see it. So it is really important to, to, to uh, take seriously the, um, the, the opportunity to, to submit ideas um, and including ideas on incentives. I think that will be a tall task because it often it may involve uh, changes in law. Um, but I think if, if we can be creative and actually look toward the possibility that incentives may actually be implemented, um, we'll be all the better for it. And this is a fairly rapidly moving train, so yes. don't delay, as they say. Okay, so today's panel is examining the current threat environment from a private sector perspective. In recent months, a lot of the public discourse is focused on cyber events that may qualify as catastrophic in terms of public health and safety, national and economic security. Other eff efforts associated with the executive order and PPD implementation are focused on consequence-based approach. Accordingly, I think it would be valuable for each of you to take a moment to describe for this audience your own view of the current risk environment and level of resilience in your sector. Some of you have touched on that, but I think that's really important. And where do you see the gaps that, if exploited, could in fact produce a catastrophic impact, if there are any? Right. I guess um, I'll start with that. So, uh, obviously, the, the, the threat is real. The threat is dynamic. The, the threat is um, diverse, right? It, we, we still have, um, if you believe what we read in the papers, nation state attacks. Uh, we have uh, active groups of hacktivists who are, or who are uh, have agendas. We have we still have individuals who are out to make names for themselves, um, and then we have you know, malicious insiders. Um, I've not seen um, uh, in, through the work that we've done with our with the IT sector risk assessment that I was heavily involved in, through talking with with our members. It's clear that adversaries are after intellectual property. It's clear that they're they're. Uh, they have the capabilities to, to steal information, um, but from the work that we've done in our risk assessment and the, the, not, the conversations I have with members, it's pretty clear to me that it's, it's not likely or, or probably even possible to take down the Internet uh, through a cyber attack. Um, I think my experience is that uh, natural events have had a larger impact on the availability of, of, of the Internet um, than any cyber attack has had. Um, I can't think of an, you know, a, there's certainly denial of service attacks, which if you're on the victim, if you're on the receiving side of those, I mean, that this causes you some severe pain. But the fun, uh, we haven't had an infrastructure collapse as a result of the attacks. Um, the you know, sectors continue to, to be able to, to, to operate, do business. You look at um, what happened in um, Saudi Aramco, 35,000 um, computers wiped away. I mean, hey, that's bad for them. I don't want to be the guy who has to clean, clean that up. But production continued. The, the, the company went on. Um, or oil, and, or oil, and oil and gas still made it to market. So I think from where I sit and what I'm seeing, the, the people who I talk with, the risk assessments that, we, that, that we've done, um, specifically focus on the IT sector, it is a resilient sector. There's not a single point of failure. Um, it's, it's redundant. Uh, it, it can withstand attacks. Uh, it can withstand a whole lot of bandwidth. Um, and I think we're, we're pretty robust and we're pretty resilient. For the, uh, okay. For the uh, health sector, there are, there are a lot of issues and challenges right now. You know, the health sector with the High Tech Act and implementing electronic health records and, and trying to stay on top of the threat landscape at the same time um, as to how is that going to impact the infrastructures. And uh, over the past couple of years, when you look at a lot of the reports that have come out on uh, risk and threats and breaches, the health sector is now the number one sector in the number of data breaches that are out there, and it's only going to get worse. So being able to stay on top of um, intelligence and situational awareness, moving from that reactive to a proactive stance for health is incredibly critical, as well as all the other critical infrastructures. 
Um, for the health sector, we also, when we're looking at, at cybersecurity around the provision of health services, there's also the security around manufacturing, you know, medical devices, and, you know, it imperviates every, every part of the health sector. But those catastrophic type of opportunities um, from where we can see something like that happening would be from cascading effects. You know, something happening in the financial sector that would cascade into health or supply chain or water or, or vice versa. Um, another one, you know, from a, recently uh, with Hurricane Sandy and helping to respond and support the health sector for that, um, if you remember, all the communication systems were down. There, there was no cell phone. There was no landline. You know, if, if you're tweeting out things, putting it on Facebook, trying to send out emails or call people, they can't see it. They don't know what to do. So as we were going through those response efforts, we started reaching out to CIOs and CISOs at those health organizations and talking about their unmet needs and what type of things that they, they needed. And, of course, it was generators and fuel and um, help, mutual aid. So in, just like when you have a hurricane or, or an earthquake or a tornado, when power lines and tree lines go down, you have that mutual aid from other states coming in to get those infrastructures back up. Well, what happens during the, a physical event like a hurricane or an earthquake where people can't get into work and you need to get those systems back up and running? having some type of mutual aid within the nation's critical infrastructures where we can all help each other um, would be tremendous, but also being able to look at those threats that are coming across and how are they, you know, impacting both, both physical and cyber and those cascading impacts that support um, all of that. So we, we have to look at it from an all-hazards and a cascading perspective. Thank you. Um, I think I think basic hygiene will, will take care of a lot of the security gaps, uh, cybersecurity gaps um, in the water sector, um, and uh, luckily, successful attacks, um, cyber attacks against uh, IT systems, SCADA systems, in water have, have been exceptionally rare, um, and um, we, don't, we don't have a single point of failure. And I'm not, and I'm not sure that there are. Um, I'm not sure that a cyber attack could do worse than Hurricane Sandy or, or other or other natural disasters. Um, the sector is uh, is quite resilient. A lot of the water systems hit during Hurricane Sandy up in New Jersey, New York, were back online within a, a couple of days. Um, some of the hardest hit, it, it took longer. Um, but, but there are alternatives to accessing um, safe water. Um, and we are um, extremely concerned about the downstream effects, so to speak, um, to ensuring that there's water for firefighting and water for, um, for health care um, and water for IT, you know, to, um, to cool facilities, for instance. Um, I think one of, the, one of the challenges we have um, is the believability that an attack could actually have an impact. I know that may sound strange to this crowd, but um, if, if this isn't your industry and you're busy running your business, um, it can be hard to really fathom that, that there's someone out there that might actually infiltrate your system and, and cause disruptions. Um, so I think that's something to take into account as we, as we think about threats and risks. Thank you. Joe or Tim? I'll just say, uh, to, to add to this, you know, our, our threats are, are not unlike uh, other enterprises' uh, threats. I, I'm not going to go into, you know, major specifics, but, um, you know, we look at, as an industry, all of those threats and do constant assessments, and uh, our engineering staffs uh, and architecture staffs do a good job of building uh, resiliency into our networks. So. Um, it's it's uh, it's pretty difficult to um, uh, take our, our our networks down, um, as as others have mentioned, uh, based on the architectures that uh, and and safeguards that we've built into our our systems. 
Um, so that's, that's Thank you. Tim? Um, I'll just point you back to the first little graphic that you drew from my PowerPoint slides. Um, <laughs> this one right here? Uh, that, one, that one right there, okay. as a matter of fact. The uh, left and right of boom is informative on this because uh, we prefer to live our lives in the left, but we have to realize that there's a reason why the second Tuesday of the month happens. Because boom occurred to somebody, and somebody discovered that there was a whole vulnerability that could be easily exploited, so they did. Uh, so Microsoft and Oracle does the same thing. SAS does the same thing. AEIOU does the same thing. They just choose different days, uh, typically on a monthly basis, sometimes on a daily under heavy, heavy uh, adversarial attacks. Um, I point you to the um, various uh, documents that uh, NERC has already published, high impact, uh, low frequency. Task Force was convened two and a half, three years ago. It produced a thing called the Severe Impact Resiliency Task Force Report, which is a real page turner, remarkably enough. Uh, cyber attack task force. It is, actually. You, I mean, you don't even have to be tired. It's a great read. Uh, but it's a significant event resiliency task force, the, the teaching from that report, and I urge you to read it, is that sometimes when you look to what bad can happen on the right-hand side of boom, you realize that just like Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, and others, you never do get back to normal. You get back to something that's called the new normal. You get back to a point where it's now acceptable to consider yourself, okay, fine, I'm kind of recovered, right? I'm going to get it back as far as I can go. I think all of us in the ISACs, clearly all of us at the sector coordinating councils, that more policy functioning body, all of us discuss this in detail. What does it look like to be in the new normal? Uh, and I point you to those, uh, which are available, by the way, on NERC.com. Um, and also I would say that the adversary is good. Um, they're not great all the time. Um, but they're good. And, and oddly enough, earlier today I was listening in on a panel, and the, the thing was, what is common? And I scribbled down a couple of things. Adversary is kind of common. We ourselves are adversaries because we keep using simple passwords and allowing ourselves to fail. We have other adversaries who are really, really, really good, and they'll correct the errors on your machine because they like your machine. Um, so those are, those are kind of cool. I don't mind the different languages that come up on my home computer when I turn it on in the morning because it runs like a scalded dog. But the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the continuation adversary is good. People fail. What is the most common way of getting something into your typically enterprise system, and what should you never have on your SCADA control system? Email, right? Everybody opens it. Fishme.com, name it, 80-some-odd percent of all of all intrusions of malware into your enterprise network comes from people going like rats on crack, <laughs> whacking on that attachment. We would actually stand behind a user back in the old day in an earlier company, and I would watch him do this, and I would tap him on the shoulder. I'm going to do it again. Don't touch. And he would. And I'm like, what? Are you challenged? <laughs> so email. <laughs> email, is, email is probably the single most difficult thing to take care of. Um, Recently, I said to a group of people, let's, let's Aramco you. They had no idea what I meant. And I said, how about schmooning? Let's just schmoon you down to bare metal. And let's say the entire enterprise goes black. You've got no outlook. You've got no contacts. You've got nothing. Go ahead and do something. Bake a cake. Do anything. I, I defy you to be able to function in that environment. So you have to exercise that. That's a bang. That's a boom. You have to pretend like you're on the other side. And then the last thing is uh, diversity is your friend. Bulk power system in North America. I, I, if I had to name a number for the different types, factors, flavors, and ages of widgets out on the bulk power system in North America, I don't think I could come up with a number. Just transformers alone made all over the world, aged from 60 years on down to yesterday, um, just the plethora of diversity makes it hard to scale many types of attacks. Humans are easier to scale an attack against because guess what? We all got DNA. We all get sick. H1N1 scared the hell out of everybody, right? That's a scalable attack across a homogeneous attack surface. So, and yet homogeneity is desired because operational costs drive way, way down when you have a homogeneous environment. So, bulk power system, doing pretty good today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim, and, and thank you. So look, we've all been invited to this process. This is an open process to try and help be a part of the collaboration in building this cybersecurity framework. I would just remind you that, as I mentioned at the beginning, those birds that I saw on Saturday morning, they were synchronized. They each knew their role. 
They were coordinated. They collaborated. They agreed on a common mission, and they were all heading in the same direction. So for us, as we close this panel today, I think we all understand what the mission is. I think we all understand that we have a shared responsibility. So let us all, as we leave here today and launch this phase of this activity, let's work to move in the same direction to meet this challenge. Would you please join me in a warm thank you to this distinguished panel of subject matter experts. And thank you for having us. Thanks, Bob. We're going to break now for lunch.